Well, we're in a short uh, series on the topic of what does a disciple look like, pretty basically. And we're looking at five different attributes, and those attributes are actions, things that we do. You can discern, you can see this in somebody's life, but not primarily to look at somebody else's life, but even a self-assessment. Am I a disciple? What does a disciple look like? So we've talked about how the disciples study Scripture. Uh, we, we, we study God's Word. Um, we are in the habit of doing that. We delight in meditating on God's Word day and night. We looked at the importance of huddling and getting together and how we're hurt by being detached from the gathering. But even from the Old Testament, the gathering and the assembly was key to being uh, someone who's in covenant relationship with God. And then, of course, we talked about assisting the church, serving the church in some specific way. That's through a spiritual gift, but it's, it's not something we keep to ourselves. In that huddle and in that gathering, we serve one another in, in specific ways. Uh, but today, we're going to talk about relaying the gospel. Just, just like you might think about a relay race, someone passes the baton, you didn't get the gospel out of nowhere. You got the gospel from somewhere. So I don't often do this, but I just want to see if, well, see, <laughs> see how it goes. Think about who relayed the gospel to you. Now, maybe it was a team of people over time, right? Or maybe it was a service. It wasn't one person. We were at a service. Or maybe you had a nightmare and woke up and started repenting. I don't know. But if there's a person that you can think of in your life, you might say mom, you might say dad, or parents, you might say uncle, you might say neighbor, you might say college roommate. Uh, I want to see if any of you would just, you know, just shout out who, who was the, a key person, maybe a key person, maybe it wasn't the only person, but a key person in your life that, you know, if it wasn't for that person, you may not have grasped the gospel. You may not have gotten... Uh, the good news, or maybe it would have been much later that you got it, but this person played a key role in, in kind of passing the baton to you so that you could pass it to others. Who, who was that person in your life? Anybody? Me? <laughs> me? <laughs> oh, don't, don't make me cry up in here. Okay, others? Your mom? Okay. Pastor Orloff, my predecessor. So, so we're coming up on 50 years at CFC, two pastors in that time. Isn't that amazing? That's amazing. That's a testament to, to God's grace. Your parents, okay, others. A neighbor, awesome. What's that? Carl Schultz, okay, missionary in Taiwan. You, from here, birth, right from, from, from this church. A youth pastor, amazing. Others? Your mother-in-law. Okay, that's awesome. Some people, you know, I don't know how many would say my mother-in-law was a key role. That's amazing, beautiful. Maybe a couple more. Your mom, okay. Your wife, awesome, amazing. Tina, well, there's a, there's a relay of the baton, right? So it's encouraging when we think about how our faith didn't just pop into existence, you know, out of thin air. God used key people to pass that baton to us, right? But part of discipleship is to also be a passer of the baton, not just to receive it, but to, to take it to somebody else. And just like a runner would fail to, to receive the baton and then run and just never pass it to anybody, uh, it's our role, our job to pass that baton of faith to others. That doesn't mean we can force it. That doesn't mean we can uh, manufacture it or make it happen, even in our own kids, as frustrating as that might be. You have to, at the end of the day, convey it, explain it, live it out in front of people, but you leave it to the Lord. He has to, he has to do it in them. But we do have the task of proclaiming God's word to others. And to look at that today, I, this is one of those topics where I'm like, you know, we're familiar with it. We understand it. You might even be already like, oh, I know. But we need to understand that it's a key aspect of what discipleship is and that it's not relegated to just the evangelists of the church. In this sense, we're all evangelists. So to do that, I want to look at Mark chapter 1. We're going to look at actually the first and last chapter of Mark. We're not going to unpack every verse. This is not possible. Uh, but we're going to do kind of a, f a brief flyover of mainly Mark chapter 1, and then we'll look at the end of Mark uh, to, to, to see this. 
So we're going to look at it in kind of big chunks. But the first thing we see right there at the top, the Gospel of Mark, chapter 1, verse 1. The beginning of the gospel of Jesus Christ, the Son of God. Now, when Mark says the beginning of the gospel, he, he doesn't mean uh, this is where the gospel becomes invented. This is where the gospel starts, and prior to this, there was no gospel. Um, what he means is the revealing of what was previously hidden. Okay, And I can take time to connect to other scripture verses to unpack that. Um, but he doesn't mean uh, there, there was no way of salvation. We didn't know anything about God or salvation or his plan. Or, no, we had lots of pictures. We had lots of projections toward it in the Old Testament. Uh, we had rams and we had priests and we had prophets and we had sacrifices. But here he is now. Uh, the one who's come from God, the one who is the son of God, the one who is Jesus, meaning God saves or God is salvation. He's the Christ, which means Messiah. That means he's the promised, anointed one of Psalm 2, for example, the king who would come to reign. He's here, and he's the son of God. And a way has been paved for him to come and bring this gospel message. And, of course, gospel means good news. It's this announcement of hope that we can have peace with God. And all of the Old Testament is hinting toward it, showing it, but it doesn't quite, it's not quite effective. You have to keep sacrificing over and over and over. And here's one who comes and solves it once and for all. And he comes on the scene with this good news that is now revealed. It's the beginning of this showing, pulling back the curtain to show you what it's all been uh, barreling down toward this entire time. So Mark starts his gospel saying, Jesus comes on the scene, and he is this unveiling and the start of the good news of salvation. Then he introduces John, who paves the way, as it is written in Isaiah the prophet. Here's verse 2. Behold, I send my messenger before your face, who will prepare your way. The voice of one crying in the wilderness, prepare the way of the Lord, make his paths straight. Who's the Lord? Jesus Christ, the Son of God, coming on the scene. He is the Lord. Verse 4. John appeared, baptizing in the wilderness and proclaiming a baptism of repentance, for the forgiveness of sins. We're going to get back to that. And all the country of Judea and all Jerusalem were going out to him and were being baptized by him in the river Jordan, confessing their sins. Now John was clothed with camel's hair and wore a leather belt around his waist and ate locusts and wild honey. And he preached, saying, After me comes he who is mightier than I, the strap of whose sandals I am not worthy to stoop down and untie. I have baptized you with water, but he will baptize you with the Holy Spirit. Here's a guy who doesn't care what he eats. He doesn't care where he lives. He doesn't care how he dresses. He doesn't care about anything. And he's not beholden to anyone. But then he says, there's somebody coming who's greater than I am. I can't even touch his feet. And that is Jesus Christ, the Son of God, who is the Lord. And he's paving a way for him to come with a greater baptism. Water splashing on you can't change you. He's got to do something miraculous in you, and I can't do that. But he can, and he will. He's coming on the scene. That's the good news. It's him, not me. I'm a messenger paving a way for the one who is the message himself. But interestingly, Jesus receives the baptism, right? In verse 9, in those days, Jesus came from Nazareth or of Galilee and was baptized by John in the Jordan. So he comes this is the beginning of the good news, but he doesn't start teaching it yet. He lives it first. It's, he receives the baptism before he introduces the entrance to other people. And when he came up out of the water, verse 10, uh, immediately he saw the heavens being torn open and the Spirit descending on him like a dove. The importance of simile. The Holy Spirit is not a dove. It was something like a dove. What was it exactly? It was hard. It was some phenomenon. They could see something there. But the point is the Holy Spirit, the, the heavens are open. This gap, this distance between man and God is, is being closed through this one and the Spirit descending on him. And then verse 11, a voice came from heaven. You are my beloved son. With you, I am well pleased. And the reason why I think, the only reason why I think Jesus submitted himself to baptism, 
was this idea of substitution, right? He comes to take our place, the place of God's people. He's going to go through it first so that he can invite everyone into it. That's why he then goes into the wilderness, okay? Uh, you think of the Son of God in the Old Testament, and you look through that, that's Israel. Israel is God's son in the Old Testament. God doesn't call Moses his son. God doesn't call Abraham his son. God doesn't call Joshua his son. But he calls Israel as a group his son. But Israel fails. And Israel's unable to follow the law completely. Israel is unable to do what they're supposed to do to follow God. So God sends Jesus to be the beloved son on their behalf so that he can bring them in. This is why he's baptized and this is why he's brought into the wilderness. When you think of Israel failing, what's the scenery that you think of? The wilderness, complaining, grumbling, I don't want that food, I wish I was back in Egypt. And then they had to wander 40 days or 40 years to kind of settle that whole issue for the next generation to be ready to go in. Well, now Jesus, he's baptized. Now, interestingly, Matthew draws this out a little more clearly than Mark does, but the elements are still there. Uh, Matthew says Jesus comes out of Egypt, and then he goes into the sequence. So what Matthew is trying to do, and I think what we see in Mark, is Jesus fulfilling what Israel couldn't do. Now, Israel came out of Egypt, they went through water, and then failed in the wilderness. Jesus comes out of Egypt, he goes through the waters of baptism, and succeeds in the wilderness. Now, Mark is flying by. He doesn't tell us the actual temptations of the devil. He's just like, he went in the wilderness, he was tempted. Mark is doing quick Strokes, that's why we're doing Mark chapter 1 today. But check it out in verse 12. The Spirit immediately, after descending on him like a dove, right? Uh, the Spirit immediately drove him out into the wilderness, and he was in the wilderness 40 days being tempted by Satan. And he was with the wild animals, and the angels were ministering to, to him. So what we see here is Jesus succeeding where Israel couldn't succeed. Satan tries his best. Jesus wins. Now when you read it in you know, Matthew, sometimes we take that to go, okay, when you're tempted, you should quote scripture. That's true, but what is the underlying point? The underlying point is Jesus obeys God's word, even where Israel failed to obey God's word. So Jesus wins, Jesus succeeds as a substitute. He is uh, acting on behalf of God's people, the people that God calls. So... He goes through baptism, he enters this 40-day period of temptation, he succeeds, now he's ready to preach. Because he's, he's actuating the gospel with his life so that he can, the gospel's not just a message, it's a person who serves as a substitute for the person who's lost, right? So he lives it out, baptism, temptation, survives unscathed, it was tough, it was difficult, he was hungry, angels ministered to him. It was wild out there, literally. He was out with the wild animals. It was difficult, but he survived it, and he passed it. It wasn't easy, but he passed it, and now he begins his ministry, verse 14. After John was arrested, Jesus came into Galilee proclaiming the gospel of God and saying, the time is fulfilled, and the kingdom of God is at hand. Repent and believe in the gospel. Repent and believe in the good news. You'll see there, as John was confirming, uh, it's a, about forgiveness of sins and repentance. Remember verse 4? People came confessing their sins. Verse 5, the good news comes on the heels of bad news. And so the first part of the message is we're in trouble. We're, we're, we're sinners. We're alienated from God. And then the good news is, but there's a way. There's a way of repentance and faith. Look at how verse 15 is not four paragraphs long. You know, what is the gospel? Well, it's this and it's that and it's the other thing. Yeah, it's deep and it's profound, but it's also, it also can be stated quite simply. He came on the scene saying the time is fulfilled. Here it is. All of what the Old Testament was picturing, all of what the Old Testament was getting us ready for, here I am. The kingdom of God is here. It's here. And it doesn't look like making you kneel and tapping your shoulders with a sword. It doesn't look like 
uh, some necessarily a ritual rite of entrance. It looks like repentance and faith to believe that this is the good news, to believe that repentance can lead you to uh, receive the kindness of God in grace through Jesus Christ. Now let me just pause there a second because the first step in relaying the gospel to others is to know what the gospel is. And oftentimes we're quite confused on what the gospel is, right? So sometimes in a membership class or membership interview, I might say, hey, give it to me in three minutes, right? (laughs) Um, Does that mean in three minutes we can say everything we know? No, but I'm trying to get, do you know the heart of it? Do you know the core of it? And Mark describes it as two components, repentance and faith. Not just a faith that God exists, but a faith that God can rescue you, that God has provided a sufficient, efficient substitute in Jesus Christ so that the repentance works and you can get on the other side of that repentance, right? I taught a college class. Uh, I can presume they're Christians. I don't know that they're Christians, but it's a Christian college, about 13 students in the class. And I asked them to write a paper, uh, five pages, single space. And I'm like, tell me your story. Tell me your story, okay? I want to hear how you converted. Even if you don't remember the moment, it was Saturday, it was rainy, dark, once upon a time. I don't care. But, but what were the elements? What, what, what were the phases, at least? What were the components? Now, those about 13 students, I think two of them mentioned at all anything about sin or repentance. Now, now let, me, let me thicken that a little bit. Prior to the due date of the paper, well prior, I took an entire class session and explained to them, you cannot explain the gospel or say that you've understood the gospel without sin and repentance. You can't explain the good news if you don't know what it's good for. What, Jesus, God loves you and sent Jesus to die for you. Why? Die for me for what? What is the bullet that he jumped in front of, right? What is the train that he took and pulled me off the tracks? What is the danger? Well, we, don't, we skip the danger. We don't want to talk about danger. That's off-putting. You know, we don't want to talk about that. We just want to talk about the rescue. But how can you talk about rescue without the peril? You can't. And I explain this. Now, maybe I'm just a poor teacher. I don't know. I might be a poor lecturer. But I think it's a reflection of poor churches, I told them, yeah, you're in, because you said a prayer, because you attended youth group. I didn't want to presume these students knew the gospel just because they might be at a Christian school or tell me that they're involved in. Each and every one of these students was already involved in Christian ministry. They had five pages, single space, to talk about their testimony. So that's not three minutes. And about 10 out of the, or 11 out of the 13 Nothing, nothing there, nothing there about I repented. I I was struck by my sins. Oftentimes we are heartbroken when people are faithful church attenders for a long time and then they eventually walk away. Did they really grasp the gospel? I mean, did they really grasp the good news on the heel of the bad news? Oftentimes as churches we just say the time is fulfilled, the kingdom of God is at hand, believe. But it's repent and believe. Repent and believe. Recognizing I'm not supposed to be in. That's how simple it was for the thief on the cross, wasn't it? Hey, man, you and I, we're supposed to be here. He's not supposed to be here. Isn't he recognizing sin, unworthiness? But yet he calls on Jesus, and Jesus says, you're you're in. He He didn't have to go to membership class. He, right? He didn't have to take a course. He didn't have to sit in church for a, a number of time, a, a number of Sundays. It's simple, but it's also very easy for us to leave out the necessary components. When we relay the gospel to others, we have to call them to repent and believe in the gospel. If your parents in here and you're trying to s- explain this to your children, you don't want them to just know the right answers, Right? Uh, ask them a couple questions about the Bible, and they're like, 66 books. And you're like, what is an Old Testament? It's a covenant. 
That's awesome that they know information. But, you know, sometimes parents are too quickly say, okay, I think they've got the theology. I think they know their way around the Bible. I, I think they're in. And they're like, I want to be baptized. And I'm like, yeah, let's baptize them. Ask them simple questions about sin. And if the child doesn't really grasp it, they can say, well, we have sin. Sin is doing bad things. But they haven't grasped it with their hearts yet. I'd say hold off. Hold off on baptism. We have to reckon with our guilt, not the concept, the abstract concept of what sin is, but that I actually am guilty and that I have to repent. And moms and dads, we can't repent for our kids. They need to repent. Just like I need to repent to believe the gospel. So there's the content. Know the content of the gospel so that you can relay what's supposed to be relayed. And you can share it briefly, quickly. Or unpack it over a long period of time, pouring through scripture alongside somebody else. But at the core of it, it's pretty simple. We are separated from God. Jesus has come as a substitute to live the life we couldn't live, take the death that we deserve. And then he rose again to conquer that death and get us on the other side of it when we repent and place faith and trust in Jesus Christ as Savior. Now, Jesus doesn't do it by himself. Even when he was walking around here, he didn't do it by himself. Look at verse 16. Passing alongside the Sea of Galilee, he saw Simon and Andrew, the brother of Simon, casting a net into the sea, for they were fishermen. And Jesus said to them, follow me, and I will make you become fishers of men. And immediately they left their nets and followed him. And going on a little farther, he saw James, the son of Zebedee, and John, his brother, who were in their boat mending the nets, and immediately he called them. And they left their father Zebedee in the boat with the hired servants and followed him. Now you'll notice Mark doesn't outline the calling of every disciple. But these in particular, why? Because they were so special? Well, in some ways, maybe. But Mark is using the opportunity to capitalize on the fact that Jesus made an analogy from their careers. So Mark is singling out the fishermen And how they came, and when Jesus called them, he used their career as an analogy. You're not going to be fishing for fish mainly. Now you're fishing for people. That's what you do when you follow me. So notice, he comes alongside them, and he says, follow me. I will make you become. We follow Christ, and we become something. Now that, we can unpack that. That's part of what we're doing in the series. But at the very least, One of those things that we become is ministers of the gospel. Follow me, and you'll become fishers of men and women and children. People. You're going to go get people just like I just got you right now. That's what you do to follow me. Now, we sometimes confuse it. To follow Jesus means to show up at church. Yes, that involves that. To follow Jesus means read the Bible. Yes, it involves that. But in terms of our ministry, Our presence in this world is to fish for people, to cast nets and watch God pull people into the kingdom of God. So he calls them, but he calls them to something specific. That is to join him in the mission of verse 15. Repent and believe. He's proclaiming it, and then he starts recruiting people to proclaim that to other people. Even before he left, right? Even before he ascended. So he brings these disciples in to his ministry. And as we move through the rest of the Gospel of Mark, I urge you to read through this Gospel. You see him training them, and they fail, and they don't have faith, and they flounder, and they don't know who he is. Mark 4, he calms a storm, and they're like, who, who really is this dude, though? You know what I mean? They're f- trying to figure it out, but it's really not until the book of Acts that you see them empowered and really understanding what it is they're proclaiming and proclaiming it with strength and boldness, empowered by the Holy Spirit. But here you have Jesus coming on the scene. He's the fulfillment of this message. He's the Son of God, and he's the Son that Israel couldn't be so that he can bring them in through repentance and faith. And then he starts recruiting disciples, and a disciple means student, and student means you do what the teacher is asking you to do. Isn't that pretty simple? Now imagine somebody who says, I'm a medical intern. I'm, I'm studying to be a doctor. I finished all the courses, and now I'm just doing my internship. Oh, what hospital? Oh, I don't go to a hospital. Okay. 
I'm a journeyman. I'm learning masonry. I, I, I'm a bricklayer. I just, uh, you know, paid for my journeyman status. I don't know. I'm, I'm floundering here because I never. Oh, great. Where do, you, where do you lay bricks? Oh, I've never even touched mud. I don't, have, I don't own a trowel. Right? This, that immediate disconnect, you'd be like, okay, you're a liar. I don't know. <laughs> or you're deluded. Right? I'm a follower of Jesus. Who have you led to the Lord? Oh, I don't pass the baton. It's the same disconnect. To be a follower of Christ means to become a fisher of men. To be a disciple, a student of this teacher, Jesus Christ, is to do what he says. Jesus says, if you love me, you'll do what I say. Well, what's a clear thing he's told us to do? Go put, pass the baton to somebody else. Follow me and I will make you become. He doesn't say, follow me if you're able to become. I will make you. And We lean on him and we have someone to follow in this. We're not alone. And we can thank God that we're not alone because we're up against a lot of stuff. Even spiritual, unseen enemies. But that's where Mark goes next. Is this going to be successful? What about people are entrenched in darkness? Don't you have people in your life who are like, I haven't shared the gospel because there is no way. There is no way. They're like almost demonic almost. Like they, they hate God. And we have a small view of the power of the gospel. And when we have a small view of the power of the gospel, we'll shrink back from relaying the gospel. But look at how Jesus comes on the scene, not just recruiting people with a message, but empowering them so the message won't be stopped. In verse 21 and following, he comes up against demons and disease and conquers both. Demons and disease and conquers both. Both a sign of the darkness that shrouds this entire world. Let's just read straight through, uh, starting from verse 21. And they went to Capernaum. They now, right, because Jesus has his, his dudes. They are proclaimers. And immediately on the Sabbath, he entered the synagogue and was teaching. And they were astonished at his teaching, for he taught them as one who had authority and not as the scribes. Here's someone on the scene who doesn't just know the words. It's like he is the words, right? He's got power. There's authority there. Verse 23, and immediately there was in their synagogue a man with an unclean spirit, and he cried out, what have you to do with us, Jesus of Nazareth? Have you come to destroy us? I know who you are, the Holy One of God. Interesting, people don't really know who he is. Even the disciples are still trying to figure out who he is, by, even by uh, Mark chapter 4, but the demons know who he is. No confusion there. Verse 25, but Jesus rebuked him, saying, be silent and come out of him. And the unclean spirit convulsing him and crying out with a loud voice came out of him. And they were all amazed so that they questioned among themselves saying, what is this? A new teaching with authority. He commands even the unclean spirits and they obey him. And at once his fame spread everywhere throughout all the surrounding region of Galilee. Think about the hold that Satan and his minions have on people in this world. And in this extreme case, this complete domination of the person where you're not even talking to that person you're talking to these personalities within the person so to speak and it's these demonic spirits and Jesus is like get out and they leave there's no sprinkling holy water he doesn't have to come back with uh, you know extra people he doesn't get out and they're like oh and they leave a mark they leave with a fit just like you tell your kid, go upstairs, and they stomp all the way up. But guess what? They went up there because they're not in charge. They throw a fit. They don't like it. They hate it. They hate losing their grasp on this world. But, you know, in this match of, of mercy or say uncle, Jesus just goes, and they're like, okay. Complete domination and authority. There's no argumentation. There's no battle. There's no physical wrestling. He calls them out, and they obey him. When we're reticent to share the gospel, we hesitate and we're fearful. We need to go back to passages like this, because you might not be afraid to talk to somebody who's literally, you know, seething, foaming at the mouth, they're convulsing or whatever. They just might be in a really dark place. So what? You have light, and when light turns on, darkness retreats. Now, your light is not your skill, your ability, your cheerful personality, or your charisma. It's the power behind the message of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Share it and watch the power go to work. 
he heals. In verse 29, immediately he left the synagogue and entered the house of Simon and Andrew with James and John. Now Simon's mother-in-law lay ill with a fever, and immediately they told him about her, and he came and took her by the hand and lifted her up, and the fever left her, and she began to serve them. That evening at sundown, they brought to him all who were sick or oppressed by demons, and the whole city was gathered together at the door, and he healed many who were sick with various diseases and cast out many demons, and he would not permit the demons to speak because they knew him. At this point, he's, he's kind of keeping his identity a little bit low profile, not really, but sort of, because he's buying time for this gospel message to go out before things get so heated that he's crucified. Okay, so now what we see is in 21 to 28, Jesus has command over the demons. In 29 to 31, Jesus has command over disease. And then in 32 to 34, it's both. It's like a recap. He's got authority over the demons, and he's got authority over the sick and various diseases. He cast out the demons. He healed people who were sick and told the demons what they could and could not say. Total domination and authority over demons over disease, any representation of the darkness and lostness of this world, Jesus has command over it. This is not a promise that we walk around and we just go through a hospital. This afternoon, let's each pick a hospital, and by the time we're done walking through there, everybody is healed and they're checking out. That, that's not what the passage is saying. The passage is saying Jesus knows how to lift the curse that is on us and on this world, and only he can lift it. But notice, as soon as we start thinking, oh, this is a message of, healing this is a message of removing sickness no that's a sign that he has the power that he backs the gospel with and they start getting confused about this look at the next paragraph and rising very early in the morning while it was still dark he departed and went out to a desolate place and there he prayed and simon and those who were with him searched for him and they found him and said hey everyone is looking for you now what do you think they're looking for him for whoa Healed Peter's mother-in-law? What about my mother-in-law? What about my cousin? What about my leg? What about my eyesight? And then one person finds out, the next person finds out, and they're starting to gather, hey, hey, we're looking, everyone is looking for you. And, and Peter and the guys are like, I mean, I, we can't do it. Come out here, people are looking. What are you doing out here by yourself? You're hot stuff, man. You can't just be out here by yourself. You owe it to the people to continue this healing thing. And he's like, no, I don't. He says, he said to them, verse 38, let us go on to the next towns that I might preach there also. Not, let's go to the other towns so they can get some healing. I've done enough healing here. He's not even talking about healing. He's refocusing them off of healing back to the actual ministry that he's about, what healing was supposed to bring their attention to. And everybody saw the shininess of healing, like, oh, he's a healer. No, 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 he's a savior. And there is a message of good news that healing was to point to, but wasn't supposed to become the thing. So everyone is crowding him, looking for him. The disciples are like, hey, go out there. And he says, actually, let's go to the next towns that I may preach there also, for that is why I came out. I didn't come out here to be a healer. Heal so that people can go, oh, maybe I should pay attention to this message. I'm a preacher. I'm a preacher. And when I called you to be my followers, I didn't say drop your nets. Now you're going to be healers of men. But to be a fisher of men is to convey the, the message of the good news of Jesus Christ, even if it's not accompanied with a miracle. It is the miracle itself. And so we don't want the gospel message to become marginal and allow church to become about something else, what we need from God or other benefits that we might get from God. We enjoy community. Yeah, that's a great benefit to have community, but this is not just a substitute for a worldly kind of community you might otherwise have. But what makes this as a, a community is the unity that we have in the gospel of Jesus Christ, the message itself. And Jesus refused to let that become marginal. And the very first disciples were letting it become marginal, and he corrects them. Let's go to the next town. Remember, we're preachers. We're preachers. We, we proclaim the gospel of Jesus Christ. But nothing stopped him when he did it. He went throughout all Galilee, preaching in their synagogues. And what happens when demons showed up? He said, get out. Preaching in their synagogues and casting out demons. The point is, Jesus' proclamation of the good news is unstoppable. It overcomes darkness. It's not overcome by darkness. It is unstoppable 
because of Christ's power. There's nothing here about homiletics classes or how he taught them how to structure their message. Mark's focus and emphasis is on the power behind the message, and that is the person of Jesus Christ. Closes with this paragraph, because I told you we're just going to look at chapter 1 and then quickly at the end of Mark. We'll move quickly, but now a leper came to him, imploring him, and kneeling, said to him, if you will, you can make me clean. Moved with pity, he stretched out his hand and touched him and said to him, I will be clean. I, I love how Jesus, he's like, my main emphasis is preaching. But he doesn't go, I'm here to preach. Get out of my way. He, he has pity on the man. But then Mark sees here an imagery that's really interesting. Jesus stretched out his hand, moved with pity. He stretched out his hand and touched him and said to him, I will be clean. And immediately the leprosy left him and he was made clean. What's interesting is what Jesus now tells him and he doesn't really listen. And Jesus sternly charged him. And sent him away at once and said to him, see that you say nothing to anyone, but go show yourself to the priest and offer for your cleansing what Moses commanded. So proof that leprosy has left them so he can rejoin the community. Still follow the Old Testament protocol on that for proof to them. Verse 45, but he went out and began to talk freely about it. Not, not a great start to his discipleship walk. Jesus sternly charged them to do A. He did B. He went out and began to talk freely about it and to spread the news so that Jesus could no longer openly enter a town but was out in desolate places and people were coming to him from every quarter. You know what that looks like when people get wind that, a, uh, that a, some superstar, some movie star, sports athlete is going to show up at a hotel and they can't get from the car to the lobby without getting bombarded by people in microphones and recorders. So now Jesus can't go anywhere because this guy couldn't keep his mouth shut. Now, we could be like, what an idiot. I mean, if somebody did that for you, wouldn't you at least do him the favor of listening to him? Could you imagine keeping that quiet? You, you've been a leper. Your skin is falling off. You lost an ear. You've been outside of your community. You haven't seen your kids. You haven't seen, maybe he's married. I don't know. You haven't seen your parents. Everybody else is playing sports, you can't. Everybody else is eating together, you can't. Everyone else celebrates Passover, you're out. Who knows how long he was in this condition. And then, just like that, it's gone. It's gone. Keep that quiet. It, it's almost impossible. He, he got permission from the priest to re-enter society, and everybody's like, whoa, weren't you, weren't you a leper? What's he supposed to say? I was just kidding. <laughs> like, what, what are you supposed to say? He was gone for months. I don't know. It's almost impossible to keep something like that quiet, right? You think Jesus knew he was going to spill? I think Jesus knew he was going to spill. That doesn't mean it was right for him to go say it, but he couldn't help it. He talked freely about it, and he spread the news, it says, verse 45. He went out and began to talk freely about it, and to spread the news specifically about the person of Jesus and the power that can only come from him. Now, briefly, I want to take you to the very end of Mark chapter 16. And we're going to see a contrast there with this leper who was cleansed and couldn't shut up about it. And then now at the end, we've got disciples that are supposed to talk about it. They're supposed to not shut up about it, and they're too afraid to. Just that first paragraph, chapter 16, 1 through 8. When the Sabbath was passed, Mary Magdalene, Mary, the mother of, Jesus, uh, the mother of James, and Salome brought, uh, bought spices so that they might go and anoint him. This is, of course, after Jesus' crucifixion. And very early on, the first day of the week, when the sun had risen, they went to the tomb and they were saying to one another, who will roll away the stone for us? From the entrance of the tomb. They've got all their stuff. They don't know the plan, really. They don't know how they're going to get in there. And looking up, they saw that the stone had been rolled back. It was very large. And entering the tomb, they saw a young man sitting on the right side, dressed in a white robe. And they were alarmed. And he said to them, do not be alarmed. You seek Jesus of Nazareth, who was crucified. He has risen. He is not here. So authority over demons, authority over disease, and authority over death itself. He's not here. 
because death couldn't hold him either. Do not be alarmed. Jesus of Nazareth, who was crucified, he is risen. He is not here. See the place where they laid him. But go tell. Tell his disciples and Peter that he is going before you to Galilee. There you will see him just as he told you. And they went out and fled from the tomb for trembling and astonishment had seized them. And they said nothing to anyone for they were afraid. You see the contrast? Here you have a guy who was cleansed of his leprosy and told not to say something to anybody. And he couldn't help it but say things to everybody that he could see. And then here you have this resurrection right in front of them. And the angel tells him, now go tell. You've been trained this whole time, haven't you? You've been taught to proclaim. You were recruited as disciples to proclaim. Go tell it. And they didn't. Why? Because they're afraid. Because they're afraid. Now, you might have a note that says the rest of the ending of Mark, <laughs> the rest of the ending of the Gospel of Mark is disputed. You know, we're not sure. We're not sure about the next few paragraphs, whether that was really what Mark wrote or somebody added that later. And I, I don't know for a fact. I mean, I wasn't there, but I th agree with the scholarship that leans in the direction that probably the end of Mark is verse 8. It's more likely that somebody came along later and was like, man, that's messed up, man. You can't just end on, and they were afraid. Next gospel. That, that's the end. It's like a really disappointing movie where you're like, that's not the end, is it? That's not the end, is it? The screen is, screen is black for a split second. And you're like, if I see words on that screen cast, I'm going to be ticked. And then there it is, boom, it starts rolling. You're like, I cannot believe they left us hanging like that, right? It's really disappointing. It is disappointing. When you're charged to tell and you don't tell. And I think Mark wants to leave it there in your lap. You're going to be the leper or are you going to be the afraid disciples? Which ones are you going to be? Now he can rush ahead like now. That's the way the story ends is actually Pentecost. The spirit comes down. They're empowered and they become martyrs. Even to the death they proclaim the gospel of Jesus Christ. But I think maybe, perhaps, Mark didn't want to just leave it on that positive note. Like, oh, okay, they did do it. I think he wants you to wrestle with the question. Like, this story actually is your story. And if you want to know the ending to this story, finish it. You finish it. You've experienced the resurrection. You've been healed by Jesus Christ. You've been brought into union with God, at peace with God when you were formerly alienated from God. And you've been commanded. You've been taught trained as a disciple and follower of Jesus Christ to go relay that to somebody else who's still stuck in darkness, who has no hope for death. Go tell it. Or are you afraid? Are you afraid? I think the reason why Mark follows up really quickly, Jesus comes on the scene, he's a substitute, he starts preaching a message, and he recruits people to the message. That's the first half of chapter one, real quick, bang, bang, bang. You're like, wait, what happened in the wilderness? Wait, well, well tell me more about the preaching. He's like, no, 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 I want to give you broad strokes. And then he slows down at the power. Power over disease, power over demons, and you start seeing it as you push through, power over storms, power over the teachers, the scribes, the temple, he cleanses it. He, he's got power everywhere he goes, and Mark is emphasizing, I don't want you to belabor the content where you're not allowed to relay the gospel until you've been in seminary for nine years. I want you to go relay the gospel because there's a power behind it, and the success of it doesn't rest on your laurels or your training or your expertise. Now, we need to get the gospel right. That's why I started with that, right? It's repentance and belief. Who it is that we believe in, not a generic God, but Jesus Christ himself. There's some stuff there we can't miss, we can't skip. But where Mark, where Mark lays the emphasis is on why we shouldn't be afraid. We shouldn't be afraid because Jesus' authority stands behind this gospel that we proclaim. I want to lay a challenge. The person that's the scariest most, I don't know, atheistic, agnostic, they hate, they would never, you'd like, they would never don the door of a church. Pick that person. Don't pick the person you think, because they're so close. That, they might even be farther. Pick the person that's, that hates God overtly. And just trust God. Book a lunch or something. Just, I just want to tell you my story. And when you tell them your story... Include the gospel, how God rescued you, how the baton was passed to you, and then leave it there dangling for them. 
you'll figure it out. You'll figure out how to say it and convey it. You're going to drive home like, I, I, I skipped this part. I skipped that part. Who cares? You'll train. You'll get better. What matters is the power that lay behind what you did share. And that power is not our ability. It's God himself. It's Jesus Christ himself. The number one inhibitor to evangelism is fear. We're scared to do it. It's awkward. It's uncomfortable. Where We don't know if this friendship is going to stick. They might hate us. You know, there are all kinds of reasons that we might cower back from this task. But if we believe that we are disciples and followers of Christ, and we understand that to follow Christ is to preach his message, which is all over Scripture, but at least the Gospel of Mark, then we understand that we need to know the Gospel, understand it's about repentance and belief. We need to proclaim the Gospel. But when we just leave it there, we stay stuck and we don't do it. It's know the Gospel, proclaim the Gospel, and trust the gospel. Trust its power. Trust its effectiveness. You know, he calls us to fish for men. We throw nets out there and we trust Jesus for the catch. We trust him for the catch. We just need to throw nets. And we do that by explaining the gospel to those who are yet to believe. Let's pray.